Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Merle Massey. I'm the coordinator for the Undergraduate Research Initiative here at the University of Saskatchewan, and I'm actually going to be your presenter today. So um, I'm not just going to hand it off to someone else. I will be the presenter today. So um, today we're going to be talking about how to make a research poster. This is something that uh, most people who come through university, whether you have to do it for a class, whether you have to do it for a summer research project because you're presenting at some kind of a conference or a symposium, or whether you're, you're an academic yourself, uh, either on staff or, of course, a faculty member, and you're taking your work to share with others at a conference, chances are uh, you're going to be creating a research poster at some point in your academic career. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And as a settler Canadian of Scottish, Irish, Norwegian, Swedish, and Ukrainian tradition, I am filled with gratitude to live within Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. I give my respect to the First Nations and Métis of this place, not just the ancestors, but those who are still here so strong. And I continually value our interconnectedness through Wakutuwin. I too love this land of vast skies and tall trees, Saskatoons and blueberries, and the swift and slow waters of the Saskatchewan river so my first question to you all is um have you ever created a research poster and if you could put it in the chat yes or no and if you did um what went well and what are you hoping to improve this time nope never yes and has nope Yes, so there's some yeses and some noes coming in on the chat. Um, well, that's good. For those of you who have, I hope that I give you some ideas of how to make it even better. Um, because the more often you make a research poster, the better you do get at it. Um, if you've never made a research poster before, I hope that I'm here to help. So here we go. So these are some of the things that I'm going to be bringing forward uh, throughout the presentation and things that you'll think about um after today so the first is context basically why you're making the poster because that does matter uh the second is audience it goes with context the third is what i call one big thing and that comes from mike morrison who does something called better posters and we're going to touch on his stuff a little bit today plain language i'm an author in my other life and i can tell you this that the plainer your language the more easily you can explain what you're doing the more easily people will understand you and uh and and listen to what you have to say so plain language is really critical Another thing that happens to me as an author, writing is thinking. So the process of creating your poster is actually an analytical process. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Good visuals, good visuals really, really matter. We've had a couple of sessions this summer for the SURE program. They have been recorded and they're uploaded on our SURE YouTube site. Please check them out. They will help you create better visuals. Um, we do have a few design tips. We're going to we're going to run through a few posters and we're going to talk about which ones you might like and 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 don't like. And the last thing is about presenting and presenting with poise. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So buckle up. Here we go. What is uh, a research poster? Um, in this day and age, you might be presenting your poster uh, online. That's a thing that happens, but you could be presenting in person. And the picture on the right uh, is actually from 2019 when we had the SURE Symposium in person in Convocation Hall, just like we will again at the end of this summer. Um, so yeah, we'll be back in person, but you also will be presenting online. So hybrid is the new way to go. So this is what a research poster is. It is visual. It is your visual help. It's your visual cue. You are still part of it. If you've ever walked through, say, the chemistry building, um, and there are a whole bunch of posters on the wall, and you walk right past them because they're just a big wall of text, and how many of you have actually stood there and read them? Very few. Um, I walk past a whole bunch every day. It's, it's not just because I don't have a chemistry background either. It's just that the way that a poster was designed to be is that a poster is designed to be presented. It's a very visual help for you to tell people about what you did. It's an advertisement really is what it is. So it's something that's very small. It's snappy. It's visual. It has to have a lot of visuals. Uh, they're very short. They're very quick. Um, you, you cannot put everything that you did on your poster. Totally not going to happen. 
So that's why I want you guys to think about your one big thing. And I'll break that down in a little bit of what that might look like. A research poster helps you to explain your, your research story, your scholarly story, or your artistic story. So it's an explainer that you use as you're standing right beside it. And it's also an analytical tool. As, as I said, in the, in the process of creating your poster, it helps you understand what you did so you can explain it to yourself and then in turn explain it to others. And I've broken down the writing process a little bit more uh, in some of the other videos. So do be sure to check out our whole section uh, playlist on communications. This is what a poster is not. It is not just your whole essay or everything that you did just on a one, just like a really large piece of paper, like a book on a piece of paper. No, no, it's not. Um, you have to be careful that it's not just a bunch of small graphics that no one can see because you have to really peer at it like this um, or understand, you know, a graphics um, are not as universal as people sometimes think. So you want to be careful about which, how many you put in. Um, it's not just your results. That's something that people think that they have to have results in order to create a poster, but not necessarily. And we're going to talk about that in a minute too. Um, another thing that happens is people say, oh, it's written up at the end of the project. That's what you do at the end. Well, not necessarily. You can actually start your poster right from day one and start working on it because there's certain things that you can map out and put in there even from day one it's not just at the end all right so the first thing remember i had that whole list of what we're what we're going through so today why are you creating a poster what is your context because that actually does matter if you're making a poster for class then it's going to be marked right so so then you've got rubrics you've got things to think about if you're doing it for a conference, it might be a disciplinary conference, so then you can maybe get into a little bit more technical jargon, but maybe it's an interdisciplinary conference, or it's an undergraduate conference, or it's something that's local here to USASC, like our end of summer symposium, uh, in which case you might have judges who are going to be coming in or people who are coming past your poster who are not experts in, in microbiology or, or um, you know, ancient Russian history or, or whatever it is that you're going to be presenting on. And so you need to make sure that you're pitching your poster and creating your poster for that wider audience. You might also be taking it to an international presentation, an international audience. And in that case, you really want to focus in on, um, on, on your plain language because you want to be able to talk to people um, whose first language might not be the language that you're using to present. And so that's something uh, to keep in mind as well. So why you're making the poster, who you're making it for really matters and your audience. And this is sort of, it goes in with the context of where you're making the poster. One of the things that your audience will actually help to draw them in and hook them in is if you tell them your personal journey. So how does this research um, resonate with you? Maybe you're doing this research work because you really want to get into dentistry or Western College of Veterinary Medicine or medicine. And so you know that you need um, research. So then you want to talk about the process of learning the research uh, journey it, or, or process of learning research skills. If it's a personal journey, let's say that you're studying cancer because your mom is sick with cancer or, or maybe your grandma passed away with cancer. And so you're really, really interested in cancer or Parkinson's or something like that. You want to talk about that personal connection. It helps people to ground who you are in terms of your larger research work. If it's just a job, they're not really interested in that. So if you just if you want to find a way to connect yourself in to what you're doing, it helps to connect your audience to you. So just kind of a hint in a tip there. This is something that we as students or we working at the university sometimes get wrong, really wrong. Um, which is more important, how smart you sound or how much your audience understands? We tend to fall in the how smart you sound really matters because if you're getting marked or you're getting judged or that kind of thing, then you do want to sound smart. The problem with sounding smart is that oftentimes people think that you sound smart when they're just plain old bamboozled and they don't know what you just said. So how much your audience understands is your goal and particularly for a poster. 
um, this really matters. It's actually important for journal articles as well, because you'll notice that the journal articles that you guys read that have like a thousand or 5,000 or 10,000 citations, if you take those journal articles apart. The reason why they're cited so often is because people can understand them and people can understand them the first time they read them which is pretty magical in, in the world of academia. So how much your audience understands and how much they understand the first time they read your stuff is really critical. So, and this is the flip side of that. There's also a difference between what you want to say or what you think you want to say and what is it that your audience wants to know. And those are not always the same thing. And this can be where people get stuck on posters an awful lot. Oftentimes, because we want to sound smart, it's about what we want to say, or we're really proud of a particular aspect. But if you flip it around and think about what does your audience really want to know or really need to know about what you just did or, or, or the research work that you yourself did or that your larger lab has or your research program or your you and your supervisor together or whatever it is, um, what your audience is actually interested in. And that's something that's quite different. So. Sometimes it's the same, but rarely. Usually it's it's a little bit different. So really what this comes down to is does audience change a poster? Absolutely it does. Um, so if it's a poster for a class, what does the syllabus say? If it's a poster for an in-person event, you need to really make sure that your poster is appealing. Will people stop? Will people, you'll be standing there going, hi, hi, come and talk to me. I have a poster. I have things to tell you. Yeah, well, you know, if your poster is a big wall of text, they're just going to quietly turn their head and walk on by. Um, if it's a poster for online, can people read it on their laptop? Or is it too small? Can they actually see everything? These are things to think about as well. And in all cases, as I said, who's listening to you? Who's listening to you present? Who's, who's reading your poster? Are you being marked? Are you being judged? Is there a rubric? Can you check that out? Are there prizes? Um, are you having a conversation? And that is your big aim, is that you really want to stop them long enough to have that interaction and conversation. So if you get nothing else out of today's presentation, this is the one thing that I want you to get. On your poster, I want you to concentrate on what I call the one big thing. And this comes from Mike Morrison of Better Posters. And he breaks it down this way. Your one big thing could be any one of these four areas. It could be that you're breaking new ground with a new theory, that you've come up with a new theory. This is especially common if you're doing more scholarly work, more social science work, which is very theory driven or literary. Um, you could be working on or expanding or changing or developing a whole new theory. It might be that your methods are different. So I, I wrote a biography of a woman who was a scientist here at the University of Saskatchewan, and it was actually her methodology that, that really made a difference. And it was so critical for her to be clear in anything that she published because other people around the world, she was breaking new ground with her methodology and they developed a whole, the, the Cobalt 60 machine, which was replicated and then used around the world. It's still used. And so her methods um, for her master's research and her Undergrad, undergraduate research really mattered. And so she, need, she needed to be really clear about her methods so that other people could replicate them. Most of us fall into the black box results. Um, so that, that's where it's, it's people want to know what you studied and what the results were. So most of us, yes, fall into that bo black, the, the box of results. And that's great. That's fine. But you don't all have to fall there. Some of you might be in these other areas. And the last box is sort of the unicorn box, um, and that's an intervention. So some of us might be working on really, really interesting stuff that actually has an intervention. An intervention is, and I'm going to make this up, let's say that you've discovered that that no one um, who um, has a picture of John Lennon in their in their room has ever gotten cancer. I mean, clearly I'm making that up, but still like some, or you eat 10 goji berries every day and you won't, and you won't get cancer. So that's considered an intervention, something that you want people to stop doing or start doing uh, right away in order to make an immediate uh, change or an immediate difference. So those are sort of four big, there are other categories, but these are sort of the four biggest categories where your one big thing might fall. 
And uh, so really think your way through that. What is the one big thing that you want people to remember about what you've done or, and what you're doing in terms of your research project? Okay, big deep breath. Um, I had an a English class in grade 10, walked into it my first day, and in these huge letters across the back wall, he had written eschew obfuscation. This is back in the 80s. So it was like that dot matrix printer. And it was all just, it was all hung together on the wall. But it said eschew obfuscation. I had no idea what that meant. Um, so I had to look it up. But it basically means um, don't be deliberately um, obtuse. Like they, don't, use, don't use words that nobody understands. Um, so plain language really is what it what it's about. Plain language is actually stronger than than regular academic gobbledygook, because plain language gets your ideas across the first time that people hear them or read them, and that's what makes them strong. And it will make your academic writing better. So this is what Albert Einstein had to say about writing: if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Um, and I like this this particular quote because that's why I like the process of putting together a research poster because the first audience that you're explaining it to is actually yourself you're reminding yourself of what you did and you're like shaping it all in your mind and you're shaping it all with your words and your images and you're telling yourself the story so that you can tell it to someone else and the simpler you can do that the better this is where I always stop and talk about how writing is an analytical tool. I work with a lot of scientists who regularly tell me that that they just the, the biggest part or the most important part of their research is doing the research, collecting data, like setting up their, their research plots or research, uh, um, whatever they're doing in the lab or out in the field, and then collecting their data. And that's the portion of their research that really matters. And then they write it up as if this is something that can happen in the last six weeks at the end. And sometimes it happens that way, but most of the time it doesn't. Along the way, you've actually had to start to do some data analysis, some analysis of what you did. And that's when you figure out, oh my God, things were not working you know it's stuff I have to change my protocol this is all wrong I'm going in a totally bizarre direction things are things are off the rails or you're like oh my gosh I'm finding something really amazing but I've gone in a different direction and I have to redo my literature review writing itself stopping to to, to write things up and analyze is an writing is an analytical tool and people forget that so when it comes specifically to a poster, your whole poster is actually going to be no more than 250 to 300 words. That's one page, one page of writing in like Word. So yeah, not a lot. Writing is about questioning, questioning yourself, questioning what you did, questioning the literature. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you criticize? Do you criticize yourself? I should have done something differently. You reflect, you analyze what you've done, you summarize it, you connect it together. It's like, okay, we did this and then this happened and then this happened. And then you look for your problems and gaps. It's all of those things are actually part of the writing process. And how to get all of that into 250 words um, is, is, is your challenge. Another thing that comes up quite often um, is that students will say to me, I can't present at the symposium world because my, my research isn't finished. Well, guess what? Um, research is never finished, um, rarely, like one particular process or piece might be finished, but research in general is never finished. So as long as you're clear about what stage of research you're at, you can present at any point. You can present before you even start to gather data and say, I've done this literature review and I'm setting th things up this way. We're just in the process of generating data. Our hypothesis is we're going to come up with this. Um, and so then, then you actually do the work and then you do another poster and present it somewhere else. But as long as you're clear at what stage of the research you're at, um, you can actually present at any time. It also means that you can write at any time. You don't have to wait till the end. You can write from the very first day that you start your research process. And I recommend that you do so. So something else to think about. Because we write to discover and to understand. 
So we're discovering what's happening with our data. We're discovering what's happening in the archive or out in the field or in our interviews or whatever it is that we're doing. And we also write to understand it, to understand it for ourselves. This is so important. I actually put a whole slide in just on its own. Um, write as soon as you start your research project. If you haven't started writing your poster, start now. The, day, the best day to start is today. <laughs> So don't worry if you haven't started yet. The best day to start is today. And the reason why is because it actually takes longer to write shorter. I know that sounds very odd, but it does. You kind of have to blurt everything out first, and then you can kind of craft it and hone it and get it down. It takes time to write an, a good poster. Um, so start today if you haven't already started and give yourself time. If you can, writing retreats are actually quite helpful. We're not offering any through the SURE program this summer, um, but there are some through the library and you can also attend the graduate writing retreats. So feel free to attend those. Um, and sometimes you can just find a Facebook group up around writing retreats that are, that are free. Uh, it gives you focused writing time. Give yourself the gift of time to write. Really important. Um, we'll talk about this in a little bit as well, but. Writing is not just blurting it out. Writing is actually edi editing. So the hardest part of writing is cutting and, and reshaping things uh, and, proof and proofreading. Another thing that I do, just so, just so that you guys know a, a secret. So we've got a couple of uh, specific writing uh, modules in our communications uh, channel as well. And I've talked about this process, but I read out loud. So anything that I'm going to publish, um, I read the whole thing out loud, even if it's as long as a book. Um, you'd be amazed how much you catch when you read it out loud. So one of the things that's really important, particularly for most of you who are students, um, is that you have to work with your supervisor. So the process of putting together a poster is not a single person process. You're probably going to be working not just with your supervisor, but maybe even with other people in your lab and sharing some ideas back and forth. It's a back and forth process. There's drafts, there's successive drafts. You discuss, you move things around. They will bring ideas and some extra focus to your work. And for a lot of you, they will have the final say on your poster as to whether or not it's actually ready to be shared. So just make sure this is not an individual process. Uh, it's very much working with your supervisor um, and or your lab mates and or uh, the people on your work group and or you know others but the process of working with others will give you a better poster so definitely do that the um so I've talked a couple of times about Mike Morrison. Uh, there's better research posters in YouTube. Uh, he has so many great points. We're going to watch just the first minute or so of this one, if I can get it to go. Can you guys hear this? No. Damn. Okay. No. I'm going to stop my share and I will share differently so that you guys can hear it. Advanced sharing options. Optimize for video clip. There we go. Okay, I'll try again. And I will start it from the beginning. Five author names, and then you try to cram your entire paper on and just try to communicate tens of. Okay, get it right to the beginning. And there we go. Okay, here's a quick recap on the scientific poster revolution. Scientists try to communicate tens of thousands of new findings to each other every year through posters. And all of these posters have used basically the same approach to design for decades. You put your vague jargony title on top, followed by your 45 author names, and then you try to cram your entire paper on the rest of the poster. We call this the wall of text. If we can create a new design that transmits knowledge even a little bit more efficiently, then we can speed up knowledge dissemination and learning across all of science. And it's a really low bar to make a difference here. We're not basing this design on any evidence or mature design principles or anything. We just use it because everybody else uses it. 
The research we do have on posters has found that, direct quote here, the wall of text is undermined by a limited ability to effectively disseminate information, and that posters have, quote, outgrown their traditional format. Link to that research and more in the description of this video on YouTube. Every time you hear this sound, or this sound, Citation. that means I've linked research in the description, and I'm gonna be doing that a lot. But the biggest red flag here is that this hasn't changed in 30 years. Nothing in science should be stagnant like that. For perspective, this design hasn't changed since before the modern internet. And we've learned a lot in the last 30 years since the internet about the science of how people consume information. If we were really applying science to posters, they would get better every single year. So last year I took a shot at creating a new default layout for scientific posters. It looks more like a billboard, and it works like this. You can't help but learn the main finding as you walk by, or you can stop and skim a sidebar for a minute, or you can talk to the presenter for a few more minutes and he has his own sidebar to present from. Or you can just scan a QR code, get a copy of the whole paper, and move on to other posters. And you can buff up your hero area with key figures and graphs. We call this the Better Poster, version 1. The Better Poster cartoon and templates went viral across the entire scientific community. It was featured in major news outlets like NPR and the Boston Globe. The free Better Poster template file has been downloaded over 250,000 times. And a lot of wonderful scientific conferences have encouraged their attendees to try it. And the feedback from scientists who've tried it has been overwhelmingly positive. People say things like, best poster session of my life. I got more conversations. I got better conversations. At this point, you'll see at least a couple Better Posters in any poster session across all of science. And that's incredible, but we can push it so much further. We want a whole session full of creative, efficient posters that teach you more as you walk through them or click through them online. And we want to unstick posters and use science and evidence to constantly improve them. Better Poster version 1 was just a bridge between what we were doing and something much, much better. And that much better thing is you! I'm going to teach you the research-backed design rules behind layouts like Better Poster so you can apply them your own way and we can all create a new generation of posters together. And okay, I'm actually going to stop it there simply because he has, it's worth your time um, to, to go through and watch his, his posters. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's a link on YouTube uh, on the site and you'll, if you just, Mike Morrison, Better Posters, you will find it. It is worth your time, so I high recommend to do that. And these same okay. principles. There we go. All right, so we're going to take a couple minutes, and we're going to look at some posters, um, and we're going to talk about what you like and what you don't like about each of these posters before we dive into, and into some of the posters design kind of elements. So in the chat, Please feel free to go ahead and say what you like and what you don't like about the posters that you see. Recognizing that you're probably all watching it on a pretty tiny screen, so you're only going to get so much. Too much text. Pictures are too small. Yeah, there's a lot of pictures. Can't see the. I know you can't see the words. I actually can't really see them either. Um, one of the reasons why you can't see the words though is because it's it's yellow on yellow. So good luck with that. <laughs> Do not like the color. I like that it has lots of images. Yeah, the color contrast is not strong enough. Very good. All right, let's take a look at another one. What do you think of this particular poster? Too dark. Distracting to the eye. Yeah, it, 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 there's a lot of text. Bad flow, it's true. You'll notice that, that there's no, you don't know exactly what you're supposed to read first. Good catch, Amelia. Yeah, too many words again, still quite a few words there. Okay, we'll take a look at another one. Yeah, it is kind of funny, Pigs in Space. Those of us who actually watched The Muppet Show when it first came around in the 70s and 80s think this is hilarious, but, you know, that's I had to turn it there. Okay, here's another one. Way too dark. Dark text. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty interesting. It says, if you can read this, you must be nocturnal. Well, that's cool. But that's the only part of it that I can read. 
And there's two sections on methods and materials, but yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. Yeah, hard to know what's going on. Absolutely. Okay, here's another one. And just remember, there's always good things about the yeah, color contrast. Yeah, the color contrast is definitely problematic. Hard to read the writing when you've got the, the, the water things going on. Yeah, tiny graphs, really hard to see. Um, text is better. There's less text, so that's good, definitely. Background makes me feel confused. That's very cool fish, yep. There's always something positive as well, which is good, but definitely some ways to improve. So um, I kind of like how the methods have lots of pictures um, instead of just a wall of text on the methods. It looks biology, <laughs> looks biology e, not readable. It, it, of course, keeping in mind that everything on your small screen is probably not very readable. So here's another one. And again, you're probably not going to be able to read all the words, um, but uh, yeah. Here's another one. Using a windbreak habitat model, small text, it is very small text. This is a, a portrait rather than a landscape one. So um, on, on a landscape screen, it's going to show a little bit less, or you're going to be able to see it less. If it was an actual poster in front of you, you would be able to see it a bit better. There is lots of blank space, um, which is a good thing. Uh, but the text is crammed. I don't know if you, uh, you said that it's well organized, Monica. The one thing about it is that you have to read, you have to follow the numbers. I don't know if you noticed that, but they're all numbered. Um, and so that's a bit of a, a design issue. Uh, it does help, you know, it does lead you kind of through it, but you know, they're all numbered. Now, if you go looking online, you're going to find lots of examples of people who've taken an existing poster and 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 given you all the reasons why why it's not very good. Um, po like abstracts, text dissolves, boring gray, too small, too much, things are crammed that kind of thing, caption not aligned, you know, so there's definitely some, so you're going to find some lots of examples on the internet of good posters and, and problematic posters. Um, here's another one, tips for de designing effective presentations. Um, and this one's got some specifics around sans serif and serif, and we'll talk about that as well. This actually is, a, is an example of Mike Morrison's better poster. So you can see the main finding goes in the center. Uh, in plain English, emphasize the important words, and sometimes you can put in an infographic. And then if somebody's actually interested in, in what you've done, then they come in and they talk to you, and then that's when they're close enough to actually read the sidebars. And so the sidebars is where you can kind of give them um, additional information and presentation. So this is an example of a better poster. This one is an example of it took the original better poster design, and then it made some slight changes to it. So um, it Andrew Smith did this one uh, specifically about better posters and about um, how to take some of the design ideas of the poster format um, and take the good parts and, and, and keep some of the uh, useful aspects, but then use some of your own ideas. So some of the best posters that we had in 2019 at the symposium actually did this, sort of ended up um, using some of the design principles from Mike Morrison and then kind of uh, worked with it on their own. So I, I wanted to, and the QR code idea is something that's really, really popular. So definitely something to think about, but then you've got to have your stuff on the internet so that it can be found via QR codes. So do keep that in mind. So now that we've kind of looked through some ideas of, of good, of um, other posters, I do recommend that you do that, um, that you go to up and down the walls of wherever you are and see if there are posters there, because you're going to see that that's sort of how it's done in your discipline. So do do pay attention to that. Um, although I do recommend uh, taking a good look at Mike Morrison's better poster design. And, and he actually has some templates as well. There's four different templates that uh, that you might be able to use. So something to think about. So. Once you kind of have some ideas on on what you think you might like your poster could do, and Amelia asks the question, should should we be using complete sentences? You don't have to. Um, sometimes a complete sentence could be about half as long as what you think it needs to be. Any sentence can be made quite a bit shorter. Uh, bullet points are very, very effective uh, on, on posters. So that's something to keep in mind as well. You don't necessarily have to be using complete sentences. So something to think about. Okay. So 
once, once you kind of have an idea of what your poster or what you think needs to be on your poster, um, you're going to take the time to plan it out. And some people have used like post-it notes on a bristle board. Some people have hand sketched. Some people have taken poster paper and just pencil crayons and just kind of, you know, figured things out or cut and pasted things. And that works as well. Um, but basically it's a matter of thinking your way through the design of both your text and your visuals and how to put them together. Your visuals are what I want to talk about next. So we've talked a bit about your text and about that 250 to 300 words, but visual design really, really matters. Now we had two sessions, I mentioned this already, but we had two sessions this summer that came from Michelle Bolton, and she's a design specialist when it comes to graphs, charts, and figures. And uh, she gave two sessions on, on sort of how to think through your figures, charts, and graphs, and how to make them a little bit better. I really like the second one that she did. Uh, because it actually took an original table and it showed you step by step all the changes that she made to make that table way easier to see and understand. So um, some interesting design components there. But here's something that happens quite a lot. We try and aim for a unified look, but sometimes all of these programs that we use to build things, they have so many options that this is what we end up with. We're kind of all over the map. We've got white on black and black on white and different shapes and just all kinds just all kinds of stuff going on and different fonts and we get a little bit too crazy and happy um and uh yes there's i i will put a link to the playlist for visual design um at the end it should be in the communications one but i'll put a link uh, jessica at the end of this if that's okay and yeah so aiming for a unified look Ideally, you want to end up with something more like on the right, just just to think your way through design so that things are quite unified. So whatever you choose to put on, you want to make sure that that any of the, the elements that you put on that you design them using the same program if you can, uh, simply because then you'll go, you're going to have some more consistency in your design on your on your um, on your poster. Um, Lots of people love graphs, charts, and diagrams instead of text where possible because we understand and we see um, images and we understand the meaning behind images way faster and we retain way more information by images than we do by text. So if you can put images in, graphs, charts, diagrams, whatever, um, photographs from what you did um, to show your methods or you out in the field collecting data, those sorts of things, uh, people really, really appreciate them. Uh, oh, I wanna go back for a sec. If you're generating your own graphics, charts and diagrams, you, that's one thing because then you're generating your own data and you're creating your own on graphics charts and diagrams but some of you might be sourcing some of your graphics and charts from somewhere else just make sure that you still remember citations still matter and permission will still matter so that you need to actually have permission to put especially if it's going to be out uh, in public or on the internet or, or um, in our harvest which is our our university of saskatchewan repository for our research work then you need to make sure that you've got permission to use that um, hockey graph or whatever it is that you're going to use um, about climate change. Okay, so I'm a historian so I use a lot of pictures in my work and um, and, and so I use things from Library and Archives Canada or the local archives. Melody, we had a whole session on how do you get permission. And so you'll get to go and watch uh, that particular video. It's in our communications and we'll put a link to that one as well. But we have uh, a video posted in our, in our website that talks about permissions and how to, and how to get them. Um, so yeah, that's a good thing. And so anytime I use something here, so if you're here, the difference with permissions is that if you're just going to show it in a presentation such as this, uh, that this is what's called fair dealing because I'm using it in a in a uh, a university context. And so I have put the citation of where this particular comes the, this particular picture comes from, Library and Archives Canada, and the actual um, title of the of the photograph. Uh, and that is enough for this particular context. If I was going to be publishing it in a book, uh, then, then I would actually need to pay for the right to reproduce this photograph. I'd pay Library and Archives Canada and, and receive their permission and pay them a little bit of money to use that in a book. Okay, 
sorry, I went too far. Words are still necessary. Uh, and so size of the words will matter. Like I said, try and aim for that 250 to 300 words, no more, less is better. Um, less is better. If you can get it down to 200 words, that would be great. Um, so it's just some ideas on text sizes. Again, it will depend on which kind of uh, poster design you choose, but you even when you get down to your captions or your body text, you don't want to go any smaller than these recommendations here. Uh, these might even be too small if you go for some of that better poster stuff. Fonts do matter. So if you're going to be reading something in print, then the serif fonts that have those little tails on them, like Garamond and Cambria, are really, really good. If uh, you're doing headings and presentations, then a sans serif font will be what you're looking for. Um, yeah, just some ideas to think about in mind. Okay, now you're ready. Uh, Rana asks, which software is best to design a good poster? We're going to go through that. Okay, because now you're ready to build the poster. And look at that, Rana's question is perfect. So software, the most common and the easiest to learn, and especially if you're a University of Saskatchewan student, you already have access to this, um, is Microsoft PowerPoint. Now, the University of Saskatchewan actually does have templates on pause and the channel. So you go into pause and then you, you type in on your search bar marketing and communications, and then they have a whole bunch of templates in there. Some of you who are uh, really adept at your computer computer might already have the software Adobe Illustrator or Adobe InDesign. Um, so definitely you can use those. YouTube is actually absolutely your friend. There are a number of YouTube videos out there, especially if you just want to choose PowerPoint. There are a number of great videos out there that will show you how to design a poster using PowerPoint. And I high recommendation that you use some of those. The next is templates. So there are a lot of templates out there, including Mike Morrison and his and his better poster templates. So those ones are out there. Uh, you can see the arrow that I have here. That's to pause to the University of Saskatchewan templates. The reason why those ones might be helpful is because they already have uh, things like the University of Saskatchewan colors built in, right? So if you're going to be presenting, uh, you might want to think about color uh, uh, as as part of what you're doing, especially if you're presenting it in a use ask um, uh, frame or a use ask audience like say at the sure symposium and yes those most of the templates that I've that I've put here are free to download um, and I do and and certainly the ones from Mike Morrison those ones are all free he does everything through open science um, his stuff is all open so you can download it and you can change it as much as you want to so I don't recommend that you pay for a template uh, I recommend that you download a free template and then just you know work with it until it you make it do what you want it to do. But Google is your friend. There's a lot of templates out there and and uh, and you'll be able to find something that works for you. Okay. White space. People get scared of white space. They think, "Oh, I've got more room. I have to fill my poster up." Please don't. White space is critically important. It helps your poster to breathe. It helps the person who's reading your poster to breathe and not be terrified. Um, it allows your poster to sing. Then you need to be able to take that breath and read your poster. Um, and, and you leave them be for a moment so that they can read things. They can step back, they can see your stuff. They can st you need to make sure that they can still read it even if they're standing six feet away, uh, assuming that they're wearing glasses and that they can see that far. But still, Whites, don't be scared of white space. It's important and critical for your poster. We do have a few rules, not a whole lot, but there are a few. And I just wanted to, to run through them again. Again, no more than 250 to 300 words, and that's max. And that's on the whole poster. So um, yeah, if that freaks you out or that freaks your supervisor out, um, just tell them, well, that's what Merle said in the design thing. Um, and then they can come yell at me, that's okay. Um, here's another rule that works quite well, 20% text, 40% figures, and 40% white space. So these, this tends to be a very good rule of thumb. White space also includes color space. So like that, like the color across the top, if you use it, or the color in the middle. Um, yeah, so on space without text. Simple, consistent color scheme. I've seen a lot of posters that have way too many colors. It's just really, really crazy. So definitely, um, definitely a, a, um, something to think about. 
High resolution. So the better resolution you can save any of the graphs or charts that you save, um, make sure you save them at the highest resolution that you can. Um, and, and of course, no background pictures or gradients behind the text. Remember that one about the fish with all the bubbles in the background and it was hard to read the text? Um, yeah. Or the one, the pigs in space one where there was all the stars between the text and it was hard to read. So no background pictures or gradients behind your text. Information should flow left to right, top to bottom. We're in a majority English speaking university, so that's important. And simple words are the most powerful. So the, the best way that you can do this is, is, to, is to do it as simply as you can. To use the fewest words with the most amount of impact. Couple of other things that we have here at the U of S that will help you is that we actually have a writing center. It is still available throughout the summer. Um, and you can have a tutor for your project or you can take your stuff to the writing center and say, I'm putting together a poster. Can you give me some feedback? If you've given them enough time, they're not gonna be able to give you feedback in 20 minutes because you have to print the poster because you're running to the symposium. Okay, that's not gonna work. Um, but if you give them enough time and get it done in time for them to give you some feedback, it's always valuable and it's free. So do take advantage of that. We also have a lot of online resources at the library around citations, quoting, summarizing, um, perfecting your grammar, how to organize it, how to construct your argument, these sorts of things. So make sure that you pay attention to those and, and feel free to use those resources as well. Plagiarism is a thing. Uh, you need to use only what you're allowed to use. So make sure you cite. If you use someone else's images or someone else's chart or graph, you have to cite it. Um, if you go looking for just because you find something online doesn't mean you can use it. So that's something that people don't always know about. That's why we had a whole session on copyright and citations and, uh, and, and asking permission. Um, because just because you can find it or download or right click it and download it onto your computer doesn't mean that you can use it. Um, so there's you need to check the copyright of, of things that you want to use and see whether or not you can actually use it. Um, the reason why this matters is for those of you who are coming into the symposium or presenting a, a poster at the symposium, we are hoping to upload all of those posters into Harvest, which means that they will actually be on the internet. So the symposium itself is not even the online component because it's through Canvas and you need to have a University of Saskatchewan NSID to access the symposium. The in-person symposium where you print up your poster and it's online because of the limited amount of time for that one, um, that one is just, just for the day. That's also not considered published. Uh, but if we put it into Harvest, which is our online repository, that will be considered on the internet. And therefore, in some disciplines, that will be considered published. And so there might be some restrictions from your supervisor as to whether or not they will even allow you to put your poster uh, into Harvest. Um, so we will all be having conversations about that for those of you who are actually coming to the symposium. All right, there are some guidelines around printing versus online presenting. And basically, all I'm going to say is that you need to know what those guidelines are and stay within the rules. So if they've sent you um, an email that says it needs to be no more than 36 by 48, you'd better be not printing it bigger than that. I don't care it, that your supervisor says, well, but you can print it uh, uh, larger because we're going to take it to this other symposium. I'm sorry, I only have so much space. So um, if you're going to be printing it larger, I need to know and I need to I need to have a conversation with your supervisor. Uh, sometimes they'll they'll want an image. Sometimes they'll want a PDF. Sometimes they want both. Um, so make sure that you're paying attention to the requirements, their submission and deadlines, the deadline for the symposium, so you can, everybody can go to the symposium and see the deadline to register to present at the symposium is passed, just so you know, thanks for the question, Melody, but anybody can go to the symposium, it is in person on August 25th, uh, starting at nine o'clock in the morning, and it's in convocation hall at the top of the bowl. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about today, and it's just the last few minutes, is selling your research to others. So this is about presenting with poise. 
And it really, really matters when you're at an in-person symposium, but it also matters when you're online as well. These are some tips and tricks that I would recommend that all of you do, even if you're just going to be doing an online interview or you're going to be giving an online symposium and you're going to be presenting your, presenting your stuff, do these. It will help you feel better and it will help you do better. So the first is actually your power pose. I really do want you to do this. Go into the bathroom uh, before your poster session or before you start recording your presentation or before you go online to present your presentation and do the Wonder Woman power pose, just like you see in the picture. It's What it does is that it draws your shoulders back. It draws a lot more air into your lungs. It deepens your voice. It makes your voice more round and strong. It gives your whole body confidence and strength and energy. Every time I go in for a job interview, I do this. I go into the bathroom, I close the door where nobody can see me, and I practice my power pose. And I make sure that those shoulders go back and that I'm breathing in as deeply as I can. I often do quite a bit of uh, uh, word uh, and or voice warm-ups as well. I might hum, I might sing, I might go through a whole bunch of registers just to warm up my voice as well. And I often do that before I present to make sure that I'm as uh, clear and articulate and strong as I can be, even if I am doing what I'm doing right now, which is sitting in my chair in my office. When you present, uh, here's some here's some really good ideas of things to do. I always prepare an oral presentation. You may not follow it exactly, but if you prepare your oral presentation, and I actually have a session coming up later in August on what I call the three minute pitch. And that is the sort of thing that you give to people when they stop at your poster and they go, okay, tell me about your poster. You've got two to three minutes to give them the big level gist of whatever it is that you've done in your research work. And that is all the attention that you're getting. You don't get 10 minutes, you don't get 20 minutes, you get two, maybe even just one. But I, I if you give you the benefit of the doubt and I tell you the three minute pitch and you prepare it as an oral presentation and then you practice it. And this is something we're gonna go over. These are some of the things that I'd like to see you put in to your three minute pitch. Don't forget to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Josh. Shake hands. If you're part of a team, I'm, I worked in so-and-so's lab and this is what we did. And sometimes people want you to talk about the funding. I usually leave funding till the end. If they're really interested, then I'll tell them that. But I always start with the purpose of my research. Why did I do it? Our lab is interested in studying this problem. We're really wanting to know what does cannabis do to people and how can it help us uh, do better health care? What can we do? What can we learn about fish that will help us uh, to solve Parkinson's disease? I always write out the presentation and practice it beforehand. So I write out that oral presentation and I practice it and I practice it and I practice it. The more times you practice it, the easier it will be, especially if you're like me and you get a little bit scared in person or a bit shy. If you've practiced it orally a few times, it will get you over that, that sort of um, stop. The other thing to remember is that as you're writing your oral presentation, it's not academic writing. You can write it in the first person. You can practice it in the first person. You're not third person sort of stuff. You're you. You're standing in front of this person. You're looking them right in the eye. We did this. I did that. I was out in the field and I rolled the quad and we broke this machine, so we had to use this other machine, and oh my gosh, this amazing thing happened. So that oral presentation is very much in person, um, first person. You can still be scientific, you can still be technical, um, but it's different from academic writing. It's first person, the simplest words you can. You also want in your in your oral presentation, you only have, like I said, two to three minutes, so you want to hit the highlights and you definitely want to make sure that you tell them your one big thing. The one, if, if they get nothing else from you, they're going to walk away and remember, oh, right, one big thing. The one thing, the most important thing that you want them to remember from what you did. 
Another thing that people actually really like, and this can be uh, part of that conversation, ideally you give them their pitch and they ask you a question and you have a conversation. That's what you're aiming for. That's what we're hoping for. But something that uh, especially professors and judges really like is if you say what you would do differently next time. So if I were to do it again, I'd do this part a little bit different. Um, or what you'd like to research next. That's something else that, that people really, really, I got really interested in this and I liked, and I would like to find a job doing something like this. Uh, there's a question from Caesar. The instructions say that we have eight to 10 minutes in length for online presentations. Yes, your online presentation, the recorded one is eight to 10 minutes. The, the in-person one, will be shorter. You don't have eight to 10 minutes if someone's standing in front of you. That's the difference. Does that make sense, Caesar? Yeah. So you're on the online presentation, eight to 10 minutes in length. So you've got more time to talk through your whole presentation and everything that you did. But the in-person one, you don't get a chance to do that. Okay. Um, and thank them. Thank them for their time and ask questions. So you're hoping to build that conversation if you can. I recommend that you do some practice presenting. Practice to people in your lab and your research group, and that's okay. The problem is, is that they won't notice any holes and gaps because their brain will just sort of fill it in for you. They know what you did. And so if you can practice with a non-specialist friend and practice until you're sure that they understand um, and fix anything that's unclear, that's your best bet. Because if you're if you're practicing with just your lab mate and they know what you did, they won't even notice that they're filling in gaps in your in your information. So practice with someone who doesn't know what you did, uh, and that that will go a long way. I might even set up a couple of times later on in in August for you guys to do some practice sessions. So that's my plan is to set up some times for you guys to do some practicing. Okay, here's some a few neat ideas. Uh, some people will do a QR code, so that's the thing on the top left, is that they'll put more of their information or a link to their lab or anything like that as a QR code. So people can just take their phone, do it, snap the QR code, and it takes them to your lab. Some people do handouts, um, and so that, that happens. Some people will take like an iPad or whatever and show a short video or a, or a laptop and show a short video of, say, you know, what it looks like to collect data in your field. So you working in the lab, you working out in the field, that kind of thing. Some people actually bring models, um, physical models, uh, and, and kind of to showcase what they've done. Um, Yes, I can share the slides via email. That's absolutely fine. And other ways to share your work include, of course, our end of summer SURE symposium. We are going to have another SURE symposium in the fall. We usually have it about the end of November. The USSU always runs a symposium in the spring. Usually it's the end of March, and that's another great place. They have a huge amount of prize money, just FYI. Uh, USURGE, that's the University of Saskatchewan Undergraduate Research Journal. You can submit your work either as a paper or as a research snapshot. And of course, you can always take your stuff to disciplinary conferences. So you can look at our undergrad, our summer, our sure summer symposium as a practice session. If you're going to be uh, taking that poster to a disciplinary conference and you just want to look at, at the sure symposium as a place to practice, that's perfectly fine and, and a good idea. And with that, if anyone has any final thoughts uh, or questions, I'm going to stop the recording and take a couple of questions. But thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much for uh, your time and energy today. And hopefully, um, I still manage to keep recording all of this. And yes, I did. So we're all good. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. Bye, everyone.